Okay, I'll wait till my Uh, Stu, can I just suggest that if people are not comfortable with being um, shown on the video, they could perhaps just turn their video off. I don't know. That's a suggestion. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm okay with uh, with it, but some may not be. Certainly, that's fine. Uh, you just click on the button and stop video, and we'll still be able to hear you. Well, so, I, I think we're pretty much there. I can, some people's names aren't the same on the screen as they are on your list, but it looks like almost everybody's here, Bev. So I'm going to mute and let you carry on. All right. So then, welcome to this. Thank you. I can't even begin to say how much this means um, to me personally and to Whitehorse United Church. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, let's, let's begin as is proper with some silence. So I would just ask you to hold some respectful silence and then, and then we'll move forward. Let it be, let it be. Uh, whenever I gather with a group of people, I like to do two things. One is recognize that uh, it's a luxury for us to be here, that there are people who are not free and for any number of reasons to be with us in a, in a gathering like this. Um, and so I would like just to honor them, whoever it is who, who can't be here for whatever reason, and certainly uh, to leave room in this uh, circle for the children. And the second thing is to remind ourselves that we're not alone. And so I've got a candle here and there's light among us and within us. And we're searching and groping for the light often, but the light is there. And so I'm just going to put that here. And then I would ask Dr. Shorty, would you please lead us in prayer? In our tradition, we always stand when we offer our prayer to Baan Ko. Dear Ha'an Ko, Gunach Chish for everything that you have given to us as Indigenous people. We are in a very dark time, Ha'an Ko. But through this dark time, we know that you are the light and that you are the way that we can find our way out. And with great acceptance and humiliation, not humiliation, sorry, humility that we come and ask you to humbly guide our steps and to help us. And maybe that word humiliation isn't a mistake on co because that's how humanity should feel for how it treats its people, us, the indigenous people of this land. We ask that you help us Han Kao to find our way and to come back to our land and to our language and to our way of being. We ask that you bless all of those families that have lost their children. We ask that you bless Canada, those Canadians, those ones that lived on privilege and stepped on our backs to get where they are today Han Kao. As Indigenous people, we um, humbly ask you to help us, to help us find our way through this grief and this sorrow, and that you help us save our families and our children, and especially our boys and our brothers and our men and fathers. Help us help us how to do our work. We ask for this in your name. Gunachish. <laughs> 
Amen. 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 So we're doing this today uh, through Whitehorse United Church because it feels like the honorable, the respectful, the right thing to do today. And we too ask for humility and wisdom and that and we ask for healing and that we will be shown and that we will find together the path forward. We ask for a spirit of humble listening and fierce and daring hope that this can be a turning time. And so on these lands, wherever you are, we in Whitehorse are here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlan Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwadun Council. And I don't know what the lands are, but you perhaps might want to take time to type those into the chat. Where, whose lands are you coming to us from? While people may be doing that, I'm just going to do some, uh, a little bit of practical things. So <clears throat> I'm not sure how familiar you are with Zoom but please mute yourselves unless you are speaking. Um, and if, if someone begins to speak and hasn't unmuted themselves, let's decide on a sign. So if someone, if I begin to speak and I'm muted, can you do this? Okay, so just, okay. Like what? Okay, thank you. Um, if you lose your connection as sometimes happens, uh, just go out and come in again. Stu will be keeping uh, watch and he will let you in. Um, some sections are longer than others. We divided them up, but some sections are longer than others. If you've begun yours and you can't go on for whatever reason, uh, just say so and somebody, uh, Stu or I will, will finish your section. At the beginning, I would say, I will not introduce you. If you have a part to, to read, just familiarize yourself with who's coming before you and just begin, just begin. And, and yeah, say the number of the, of the call to action that you're reading, partly so that if someone has lost their place, we can reorient. And if, if uh, it's your turn and about 10 seconds goes by and you haven't begun, then I will introduce you. Okay, um, and just finally, uh, this is not about being perfect. If you're nervous about reading, I can understand that, but this isn't about, a, it's imp what's important is that we're doing this together and your voice really counts. It's so, the, the, the wonder of this is going to be the different voices. So don't, don't worry about it, just do what you can. And uh, yeah, so. We're going to begin then. And Dwayne, are you there and ready to go? Yes, I am. Okay, so then welcome Dwayne and just please uh, uh, begin. Good cheese. I think good cheese to get you on. I think good cheese hot you naughty. I think good cheese a gonkun kwan. I think good cheese Connie, Dr. Shorty. I, I just wanted, before I start, as, as an Indigenous, as a Two-Spirit, I just wanted to hold my hands up to the United Church. For all that you do to hold, hold up my, my Indigenous people, my Two-Spirit people, that you practice what you preach, and it'd be good if other Christians and denominations would take your example. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. <laughs> 
So the 94 calls to actions in order to redress the legacy of residential schools and advance the process of Canadian reconciliation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission makes the following calls to action. Legacy, child welfare, action number one. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial and Aboriginal governments to commit to reducing the number of Aboriginal children in care by one, monitoring and assessing, assessing neglect investigations, two, providing adequate resources to enable Aboriginal communities and child welfare organizations to keep Aboriginal families together where it is safe to do so and to keep children in culturally appropriate environments, regardless of where they reside. Three, ensuring that social workers and others who conduct child welfare investigations are properly educated and trained about the history and impacts of residential schools. Four, ensuring that social workers and others who conduct child welfare investigations are properly educated and trained about the potential for Aboriginal communities and families to provide more appropriate solutions to family healing. Five, requiring that all child welfare decision makers consider the impact of the residential school experience on children and their caregivers. Call to action number two. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with the provinces and territories to prepare and publish annual reports on the number of Aboriginal children, First Nations, Inuit and Métis who are in care compared with non-Aboriginal children as well as the reasons for apprehension. The total spending on preventative and care services by child welfare agencies and the effectiveness of various interventions. Call to action number three. We call upon all levels of government to fully implement Jordan's principle. Call to action number four. We call upon the federal government to enact Aboriginal child welfare legislation that establishes national standards for Aboriginal child apprehension and custody cases and includes principles that one, affirm the right of Aboriginal governments to establish and maintain their own child welfare agencies. Number two, require all child welfare agencies and courts to take the residential school legacy into account in their decision-making. And number three, establish as an important priority a requirement that placements of Aboriginal children into temporary and permanent care be culturally appropriate. Number five, we call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to develop culturally appropriate parenting programs for Aboriginal families. Under education, number six, we call upon the government of Canada to repeal section 43 of the Criminal Code of Canada. This section uh, refers to the use of force to discipline children. Uh, they refer to it as the spanking law. Number seven, we call upon the federal government to develop with Aboriginal groups a joint strategy to eliminate educational and employment gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Number eight, we call upon the federal government to eliminate the discrepancy in federal education funding for First Nations children being educated on reserves and, and, and those First Nations children being educated off reserves. Number nine, we call upon the federal government to prepare and publish annual reports comparing funding for the education of First Nations children on and off reserves, as well as educational and income attainments of Aboriginal peoples in Canada compared with non-Aboriginal people. 10. 
we call on the federal government to draft new Aboriginal education legislation with the full participation and informed consent of Aboriginal peoples. The new legislation would include a commitment to sufficient funding and would incorporate the following principles. One, providing sufficient funding to close identified educational achievement gaps within one generation. Two, improving educational attainment levels and success rates. Three, developing culturally appropriate curricula. Four, protecting the right to Aboriginal languages, including the teaching of Aboriginal languages as credit courses. Five, enabling parental and community responsibility, control and accountability, similar to what parents enjoy in public school systems. Six, enabling parents to fully participate in the education of their children. Seven, respecting and honouring treaty relationships. Number 11, we call upon the federal government to provide adequate funding to end the backlog of First Nations students seeking a post-secondary education. 12, we call upon the federal, provincial, territorial and Aboriginal governments to develop culturally appropriate early childhood education programs for Aboriginal families. Language and culture, number 13, we call upon the federal government to acknowledge that Aboriginal rights include Aboriginal language rights. Number 14, we call upon the federal government to enact an Aboriginal Languages Act that incorporates the following principles. Number one, Aboriginal languages are a fundamental and valued element of Canadian culture and society. There is an urgency to preserve them. Number two, Aboriginal language rights are reinforced by the treaties. Number three, the federal government has a responsibility to provide sufficient, fun sufficient funds for Aboriginal language revitalization and preservation. Number four, the preservation, revitalization and strengthening of Aboriginal languages and cultures are best managed by Aboriginal people and communities. Number five, funding for Aboriginal language initiatives must reflect the diversity of Aboriginal languages. Number 15, we call upon the federal government to appoint in consultation with Aboriginal groups and Aboriginal language, uh, Languages Commissioner. The Commissioner should help promote Aboriginal languages and report on the adequacy of federal funding of Aboriginal languages initiatives. 16, we call upon post-secondary institutions to create university and college degree and diploma programs in Aboriginal languages. Bev, I think Julia got dropped. Rhoda Northrup would be Julia. Julia, if you can hear me. Now I can. Okay. Uh, 17. And I'm not sure how far I'm supposed to read. 17, we call upon all levels of government to enable residential school survivors and their families to reclaim names changed by the residential school system by waiving administrative costs for a period of five years for the name change process and the revision of official identity documents, such as birth certificates, passports, driver's licenses, health cards, status cards, and social insurance numbers. In health, we call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize and implement 
the health care rights of Aboriginal people as identified in international law, constitutional law, and under the treaties. 19. We call upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal peoples to establish measurable goals to identify and close the gaps in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities and to publish annual progress reports and assess long-term trends. Such efforts would focus on indicators such as infant mortality, matern maternal health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, birth rates, infant and child health issues, chronic diseases, illness and injury incidents, and the availability of appropriate health services. 20. In order to address the jurisdictional disputes concerning Aboriginal people who do not reside on reserves, we call upon the federal government to recognize, respect, and address the distinct health needs of the Métis, Inuit, and off-reserve Aboriginal peoples. And now Jennifer will take it from here. Thank you. Call to action number 21. We call upon the federal government to provide sustainable funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centers to address the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual harms caused by residential schools and to ensure that the funding of healing centers in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories is a priority. Number 22, we call upon those who can affect change within the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the value of Aboriginal healing practices and use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients in collaboration with Aboriginal healers and elders where requested by Aboriginal patients. We call upon all levels of government to increase the number of Aboriginal professionals working in the healthcare field. Two, ensure the retention of Aboriginal healthcare providers in Aboriginal communities. And three, provide cultural competency training for all healthcare professionals. Number 24, we call upon medical and nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, and Indigenous teachings and practices. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Justice section, call for action number 25. We call upon the federal government to establish a written policy that reaffirms the independence of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to investigate crimes in which the government has its own interest as a potential or real party in civil lit litigation. Call for action number 26. We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to review and amend their respective statutes of limitations to assure and to ensure that they conform to the principle that governments and other entities cannot rely on limitation defenses to defend legal actions of historical abuse brought by Aboriginal people. We call upon, to call for action number 27, we call upon the Federation of Law Societies of Canada to ensure that lawyers receive appropriate cultural competency training, which includes the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indig Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law and Aboriginal Crown relations. This will, this will require skill-based skills -based training in intercultural competency conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Call for action number 28. We call upon law schools in Canada to require all law students to take a course in Aboriginal people and the law, which includes the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, treaties and Aboriginal rights, 
ind indigenous law and Aboriginal crown relations. This rule requires skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Twenty nine. We call upon the parties and in particular the federal government to work collaboratively with plaintiffs not included in the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement to have disputed legal issues determined expeditiously on an agreed statement, set of facts. 30. We call upon federal, provincial, and territorial governments to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade and to issue detailed annual reports that monitor and evaluate progress in doing so. 31, we call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to provide sufficient and stable funding to implement and evaluate community sanctions that will provide realistic alternatives to imprisonment for Aboriginal offenders and respond to the underlying causes of offending. 32, we call upon the federal government to amend the criminal code to allow trial judges upon given reasons to depart from mandatory minimum sentences and restrictions on the use of conditional sentences. Bev, I don't see Billy Joe Alexa signed in under that name. Billy Joe, if you are here under another name, can you identify yourself? Then I'm going to begin to read them. Billy Joe, if you come in, just speak up and let me know. 33, we call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to recognize as a high priority, the need to address and prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and to develop in collaboration with Aboriginal people, FASD preventative programs that can be delivered in a culturally appropriate manner. 34, we call upon the governments of Canada, the provinces and territories to undertake reforms to the criminal justice system to better address the needs of offenders with FASD, including providing increased community resources and powers for courts to ensure that FASD is properly diagnosed and that appropriate community supports are in place for those with FASD, enacting statutory exemptions from mandatory minimum sentences of imprisonment for offenders affected by FASD, providing community, correctional and parole resources to maximize the ability of people with FASD to live in the community. Adopting appropriate evaluation mechanisms to measure the effectiveness of such programs and ensure community safety. 35. We call upon the federal government to eliminate barriers to the creation of additional Aboriginal healing lodges within the federal correctional system. And 36, we call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to work with Aboriginal communities to provide culturally relevant services to inmates on issues such as substance abuse, family, domestic violence, and overcoming the experience of having been sexually abused. Marianne. 
I see your name. We can't hear you, Marianne. I'm not sure what's happening. It doesn't say that she's muted. We had agreed then that if someone is unable for whatever reason, that Stu and I would uh, read. So Stu, do you mind reading uh, 37 to 40? We call upon the federal government to provide more supports for Aboriginal programming in halfway houses and parole services. 38. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial and Aboriginal governments to commit to eliminating the over-representation of Aboriginal youth in custody over the next decade. 39. We call upon the federal government to develop a national plan to collect and publish data on the criminal victimization of Aboriginal people, including data related to homicide and family violence victimization. 40. We call on all levels of government in collaboration with Aboriginal people to create adequately funded and accessible Aboriginal specific victim programs and services with appropriate evaluation mechanisms. 41. We call upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal organizations to appoint a public inquiry into the causes of and remedies for the disproportionate victimization of Aboriginal women and girls. The inquiry's mandate would include, one, investigation into missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls, two, links to the intergenerational legacy of residential schools. 42, we call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to commit to the recognition and implementation of Aboriginal justice systems in a manner consistent with the treaty and Aboriginal rights of Aboriginal peoples. The Constitution Act 1982 and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples endorsed by Canada in November, 2012. Reconciliation. Canadian governments and the United Nations Declaration on the rights of indigenous people. 43, we call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as the framework for reconciliation. 44, we call upon the Government of Canada to develop a national action plan, strategies, and other concrete measures to achieve the goals of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. <clears throat> Royal Proclamation and Covenant of Reconciliation. We call upon the Government of Canada on behalf of all Canadians to jointly develop with Aboriginal peoples a Royal Proclamation of Reconciliation to be issued by the Crown. The proclamation would build on the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara of 1764 and reaffirm the nation to nation You're muted, Denise. All of a sudden you were just muted. Denise? Can you unmute her, Stu? On the right I'm, 
Okay. There, there she is. Denise, all of a sudden you were you were muted. I'm not sure what's happening at your end, but you're not. Uh, now. Yeah, my my phone was ringing. I'll reread that. Okay. So uh, the the following commitments: one, repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous lands and peoples such as the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius. Two, adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. Three, renew or establish treaty relationships based on principles of mutual recognition, mutual respect, and shared responsibility for maintaining those relationships into the future. Four, reconcile Aboriginal and Crown constitutional and legal orders to ensure that Aboriginal peoples are full partners in Confederation, including the recognition and integration of Indigenous laws and legal traditions in negotiation and implementation processes involving treaties, land claims, and other constructive agreements. 46. We call upon the parties to the Indian Reg Residential Schools Settlement Agreement to develop and sign a covenant of reconciliation that would identify principles for working collaboratively to advance reconciliation in ca Canadian society and that would include, but not be limited to, one, reaffirmation of the party's commitment to reconciliation repudiation of concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous lands and peoples, such as the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius, and the reformation of laws, governance structures, and policies within their respective institutions that continue to rely on such concepts. Three, full adoption and implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. Four, support the renewal or establishment of treaty relationships based on principles of mutual recognition, mutual respect, and shared responsibility for maintaining those relationships into the future. Five, enabling those excluded from the settlement agreement to sign onto the covenant of reconciliation. And six, enabling additional parties to sign on to the covenant, reconcili covenant of reconciliation. Call to action number 47. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous peoples and lands, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullis and to reform those laws, government policies, and litigation strategies to continue to rely on such concepts. Settlement Agreement Parties and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Call to action number 48. We call upon the church parties to the settlement agreement and all other faith groups and interfaith social justice groups in Canada who have not already done so to formally adopt and comply with the principles, norms, and standards of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. This would include but not be limited to the following com commitments. One, ensuring that their institutions, policies, programs, and practices comply with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Two, respecting Indigenous people's right to self-determination in spiritual matters, including the right to practice, develop, and teach their own spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies, consistent with Article 12.1 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Three, engage in ongoing public dialogue and actions to support the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And four, issuing a statement no later than March 31st, 2016 from, the, from all religious denominations and faith groups as to how they will implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples.
49, we call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who have not already done so to repudiate concepts used to justify Europe, European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. The next section is equity for Aboriginal people in the legal system. Number 50. In keeping with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal organizations to fund the establishment of Indigenous law institutes for the development, use, and understanding of Indigenous laws and access to justice in accordance with the unique cultures of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. 51. We call upon the Government of Canada as an obligation of its fiduciary responsibility to develop a policy of transparency by publishing legal opinions it develops and upon which it acts or intends to act in regard to the scope and extent of Aboriginal and treaty rights. 52. We call upon the Government of Canada, provincial and territorial governments, and the courts to adopt the following legal principles. I. Aboriginal, Aboriginal title claims are accepted once the Aboriginal claimant has established occupation over a particular territory at a particular point in time. I. I. Which is two. Once Aboriginal title has been established, the burden of proving any limitation on any rights arising from the existence of that title shifts to the party asserting such a limitation. Spence? You don't know how to... Stu, can you unmute her? There, there. National Council for Reconciliation, call to action number 53. We call upon the Parliament of Canada in consultation and collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to enact legislation to establish a National Council for Reconciliation. The legislation would establish the Council as an independent national oversight body with membership jointly appointed by the Government of Canada and national Aboriginal organizations and consisting of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal members. Its mandate would include, but not be limited to, the following. One, monitor, evaluate, and report annually to the Parliament and the people of Canada on the Government of Canada's post-apology progress on reconciliation to ensure the government accountability for reconciling the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the Crown is maintained in the coming years. Two, monitor, evaluate, and report to Parliament and the people of Canada on reconciliation progress across all levels and sectors of Canadian society, including the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action. Three, develop and implement a multi-year national action plan for reconciliation, which includes research and policy development, public education programs, and resources. Four, promote public dialogue, public-private partnerships, and public initiatives for reconciliation. Number 54, we call upon the Government of Canada to provide multi-year funding to the National Council for Reconciliation to ensure that it has the financial, human, and technical resources required to conduct its work, including the endowment of the National Reconciliation Trust to advance the cause of reconciliation. 56. We call upon all levels of government to provide annual reports or any current data requested by the National Council for Reconciliation 
so that it can report on the progress towards reconciliation. The reports or data would include, but not be limited to, one, the number of Aboriginal children, including Métis and Inuit children, in care compared with non-Aboriginal children, the reasons for apprehension, and the total spending on preventative and care services by child welfare agencies. Two, comparative funding for the education of First Nations children on and off reserves. Three, the educational and income attainments of Aboriginal peoples in Canada compared with non-Aboriginal people. Four, progress on closing the gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities in a number of health indicators, such as infant mortality, maternal health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, birth rates, infant and child health issues, chronic illness, injury, illness and injury incidents, and the availability of appropriate health services. Five, progress on eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children in youth custody over the next decade. Six, progress on reducing the rate of criminal victimization of Aboriginal people, including data related to homicide and family violence victimization and other crimes. Progress on reducing the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the justice and correctional systems. Call to action number 56. We call upon the Prime Minister of Canada to formally respond to the report of the National Council for Reconciliation by issuing an annual State of, Abor State of Abor uh, Aboriginal Peoples report, which would outline the government's plan for advancing the cause of reconciliation. Professional Development and Training for Public Servants. Call to Action 57. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to provide education to public servants on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal Crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Church apologies and reconciliation. Call to action 58. We call upon the Pope to issue an apology to survivors, their families, and communities for the Roman Catholic Church's role in the spiritual, cultural, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children in Catholic-run residential schools. We call for that apology to be similar to the 2010 apology issued to Irish victims of abuse and to occur with one, in one year of the issuing of this report and to be delivered by the Pope in Canada. Call to action 59. We call upon church parties to the settlement agreement to develop ongoing education strategies to ensure that their respective congregations learn about their church's role in colonization, the history and legacy of residential schools, and why apologies to former residential school students, their families, and communities were necessary. Call to action 60. We call upon leaders of the church parties to the settlement agreement and all other faiths in collaboration with indigenous spiritual leaders, survivors, schools of theology, seminaries, and other religious training centers to develop and teach curriculum for all student clergy and all clergy and staff who work in Aboriginal communities on the need to respect indigenous spirituality in its own right the history and legacy of residential schools, 
and the roles of the church parties in that system, the history and legacy of religious conflict in Aboriginal families and communities, and the responsibility that churches have to mitigate such conflicts and prevent spiritual violence. Number 61, <clears throat> we call upon church parties to the settlement agreement in collaboration with survivors and representatives of Aboriginal organizations to establish permanent funding to Aboriginal people for one, community controlled healing and reconciliation projects, two, community controlled culture and language revitalization projects, three, community controlled education and relationship building projects, four, regional dialogues for indigenous spiritual leaders and youth to discuss indigenous spirituality, self-determination and reconciliation. Education for reconciliation. Number 62, we call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments in consultation and collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal peoples and educators to one, make age appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties and Aboriginal peoples historical and contemporary contributions to Canada a mandatory education requirement for kindergarten to grade 12 students. Two, provide the necessary funding to post-secondary institutions to educate teachers on how to integrate Indigenous knowledge and teaching methods into classrooms. Three, provide the necessary funding to Aboriginal schools to utilise Indigenous knowledge and teaching methods in the classrooms. And four, establish senior level positions in government at the assistant deputy minister level or higher dedicated to Aboriginal content in education. And number 63, we call upon the Min Council of Ministers of Education Canada to maintain an annual commitment to Aboriginal education issues, including one, developing and implementing kindergarten to grade 12 curriculum and learning resources on Aboriginal peoples in Canadian history and the history and legacy of residential schools. Two, sharing information and best practices on teaching curriculum related to residential schools and Aboriginal history. Three, building student capacity for intercultural understanding empathy and mutual respect. And four, identifying teacher training needs related to the above. We call upon all levels of government that provide public funds to denominational schools to require such schools to provide an education on comparative religious studies, which must include a segment on Aboriginal spiritual beliefs and practices developed in collaboration with Aboriginal elders. 65, we, we call upon the federal government through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, post-secondary institutions and educators at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and its partner institutions to establish a national research program with multi-year funding to advance understanding of reconciliation. Youth programs, 66. We call upon the federal government to establish multi-year funding for community-based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation and establish a national network to share information and best practices. Museums and archives, 67. We call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Museums Association to undertake in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, a national review of museum policies and best practices to determine the level of compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and to make recommendations. 68. 
we call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples and the Canadian Museums Association to mark the 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation in 2017 by establishing a dedicated national funding program for commemoration projects on the theme of reconciliation. Number 69, we call upon Library and Archives Canada to, number one, fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the United Nations Jonette Ordlicker Principles as related to Aboriginal peoples' inalienable right to know the truth about what happened and why with regard to human rights violations committed against them in the residential schools. Number two, ensure that its record holdings related to residential schools are accessible to the public. And number three, commit more resources to its public education materials and programming on residential schools. Number 70, we call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Association of Archivists to undertake in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples a national review of archival policies and best practices to, number one, determine the level of compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the United Nations Joinet or Liqueur Principles as related to Aboriginal people's inalienable right to know the truth about what happened and why with regard to human rights violations committed against them in the residential schools. Number two, produce a report with recommendations for full implementation of these international mechanisms as a reconciliation framework for Canadian archives. Missing children and burial information, call to action number 71. We call upon all chief coroners and provincial vital statistics agencies that have not provided to the Truth and Reconciliation of Canada their records on the death of Aboriginal children in the Canary of residential school authorities to make these documents available to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Number 72. We call upon the federal government to allocate sufficient resources to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation to allow it to develop and maintain the National Residential School Student Death Register established by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Just before I start reading uh, 73 to 76, I wish to make a statement that I I'm a daughter of a residential school survivor and that I am still here. I have a daughter who is going to be having a child soon and this is why we are doing this. We're doing this for them. Number 73, we call upon the federal government to work with churches, Aboriginal communities and former residential schools to establish and maintain an online registry of residential school cemeteries including, where possible, plot maps showing the location of deceased residential school children. We call upon the federal government to work with the churches and Aboriginal community leaders to inform the families of children who died at residential schools of the child's burial location and to respond to the family's wishes for appropriate commemoration ceremonies and markers and reburial in home communities where requested. We call upon the federal government to work with provincial, territorial, and municipal governments, churches, Aboriginal communities, former residential school students, and current landowners to develop and implement strategies and procedures for ongoing identification, documentation, maintenance, commemoration, and protection of residential school cemeteries or other sites at which residential school children are buried. This is to include the provision of appropriate memorial ceremonies and commemorative markers to honor the deceased children. Number 76, 
We call upon the parties engaged in the work of documenting, maintaining, commemorating, and protecting residential school cemeteries to adopt strategies in accordance with the following principles. One, the Aboriginal community most affected shall lead the development of such strategies. Two, information shall be sought from residential school survivors and other knowledge keepers in the development of such strategies. And three, Aboriginal protocols shall be respected before any potentially invasive technical inspection and investigation of a cemetery site. National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Number 77, we call upon provincial, territorial, municipal, and community archives to work collaboratively with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation to identify and collect copies of all records relevant to the history and legacy of the residential school system and to provide these to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. 78. We call upon the Government of Canada to commit to making a funding contribution of $10 million over seven years to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, plus an additional amount to assist communities to research and produce histories of their own residential school experience and their involvement in truth, healing, and reconciliation. Commemoration. 79. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal organizations, and the arts community to develop a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage and commemoration. This would include, but not be limited to, one, amending the Historic Sites and Monuments Act to include First Nations, Inuit, and Métis representation on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada and its Secretariat. Two, revising the policies, criteria, and practices of the National Program of Historical Commemoration to integrate Indigenous history, heritage values, and memory practices into Canada's national heritage and history. And three, developing and implementing a national heritage plan and strategy for commemorating residential school sites the history and legacy of residential schools and the contributions of Aboriginal peoples to Canada's history. 80, we call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to establish as a statutory holiday, a national day for truth and reconciliation to honor survivors, their families and communities and ensure that public commemoration of the history and legacy of residential schools remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. Number 81, we call upon the federal government in collaboration with survivors and their organizations and other parties to the settlement agreement to commission and install a publicly accessible, highly visible residential school national monument in the city of Ottawa to honor survivors and all the children who are lost to their families and communities. 82, we call upon provincial and territorial governments in collaboration with survivors and their organizations and other parties to the settlement agreement to commission and install a publicly accessible, highly visible residential schools monument in each capital city to honor survivors and all the children who were lost to their families and communities. 83, we call upon the Canadian the Canada Council for the Arts to establish as a funding priority a strategy for Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists to undertake collaborative projects and produce works that contribute to the reconciliation process. Media and reconciliation. Number 84, we call upon the federal government to restore and increase funding to the CBC Radio Canada to enable Canada's national public broadcaster to support reconciliation and be properly reflective of the diverse cultures, language, and perspectives of Aboriginal peoples, including but not limited to, one, increasing Aboriginal programming, including Aboriginal language speakers, two, increasing equitable access for Aboriginal peoples to jobs, leadership positions, and professional development opportunities within the organization, three, 
continuing to provide dedicated news coverage and online public information resources on issues of concern to Aboriginal peoples and all Canadians, including the history and legacy of residential schools and the reconciliation process. Call to action number 85. We call upon the Aboriginal People's Television Network as an independent nonprofit broadcaster with programming by, for, and about Aboriginal peoples to support reconciliation, including, but not limited to, one, continuing to provide leadership and programming and organizational culture that reflects the diverse cultures, languages, and perspectives of Aboriginal peoples. Two, continuing to develop media initiatives that inform and educate the Canadian public and connect Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Number 86, we call upon Canadian journalism programs and media schools to require education for all students on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law and Aboriginal crown relations, sports and reconciliation. We call upon all levels of government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, sports halls of fame and other relevant organizations to provide public education that tells the national story of Aboriginal athletes in history. And number 88, we call upon all levels of government to take action to ensure long-term Aboriginal athletic athlete development and growth and continued support for the North American Indigenous Games, including funding to host the games and for provincial and territorial team participation and travel. Number 89, we call upon the federal government to amend the Physical Activity and Sport Act to support reconciliation by ensuring that policies to, to promote physical activity as a fundamental element of health and well being reduce barriers to sport participation, increase the pursuit of excellence in sport and build capacity in the Canadian sport system are inclusive of Aboriginal peoples. Number 90, we call upon the federal government to ensure that national sports policies, programs and initiatives are inclusive of Aboriginal, Aboriginal peoples, including but not limited to establishing one in collaboration with provincial and territorial governments, stable funding for and access to community sports programs that reflect the diverse cultures and traditional sporting activities of Aboriginal peoples. Two, an elite athlete development program for Aboriginal athletes. Three, programs for coaches, trainers and sports officials that are culturally relevant for Aboriginal peoples. Four, anti-racism awareness and training programs. Call to action number 91. We call upon the officials and host countries of international sporting events, such as the Olympics, Pan Am and Commonwealth Games to ensure that Indigenous peoples, territorial protocols are respected and local Indigenous communities are engaged in all aspects of planning and participating in such events. Business and reconciliation. Number 92. We call upon the corporate sector in Canada to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a reconciliation framework and to apply its principles norms and standards to corporate policy and core operational activities involving Indigenous peoples and their lands and resources. 
This would include, but not be limited to, the following. One, commit to meaningful, meaningful consultation, building respectful relationships, and obtaining the free, prior, and informed consent of Indigenous peoples before proceeding with economic development projects. Two, ensure that Aboriginal peoples have equitable access to jobs, training, and educational opportunities in the corporate sector, and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from economic development projects. Three, provide education for management and staff on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law and Aboriginal crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Newcomers to Canada. Call to action number 93. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with the national Aboriginal organizations to revise the information kit for newcomers to Canada and its citizenship test to reflect a more inclusive history of the diverse Aboriginal peoples of Canada, including information about the treaties and the history of residential schools. And the final call to action, number 94. We call upon the Government of Canada to replace the oath of citizenship with the following. I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada, including treaties with Indigenous peoples and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. So someone once said, anyone with ears to hear, let them hear. And I pray that we have truly heard because we have ears to hear. I pray that we'll hear and act, that we'll do so asking for wisdom from one another and from our creator. Uh, that we have in all of this process, compassion uh, in equal measure with commitment and action. May we all seek understanding and imagination because there are things that are possible that we haven't even begun to discover when our hearts are open and our minds are educated and we have what it takes to say yes. So I pray that we will go forward seeking understanding and imagination and grace upon grace. And thank you for, for doing this. And it's up to uh, um, let people know that we've done this, talk about it, do what you need to do to keep this going and uh, bless us, bless us everyone. I think I'm going to say goodbye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I wish you, um, I wish you a contemplative, is that the right word? A contemplative Canada Day. Okay. Bye-bye.